Hi, my name is David Jones. I'm sitting in the Yellow Deli in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And I've been sitting in the Yellow Deli since 1973, working there. And uh, I wanted to give you a little history about how the Yellow Deli came about. I know that when I first walked into the Yellow Deli, I felt like I came into a different world. And I would have to say that a lot of people have that same experience. And so how this, this came about, I'd like to tell you about it. And uh, I would say that in order to understand the Yellow Deli, you have to understand one man, Gene Spriggs. Gene was born here in Chattanooga in 1937 the son of uh, very devoted Christian parents. His father really loved his son. And Gene grew up under the authority of a man that was very warm, very kind. Gene came to understand authority through his father, who one of the little stories that Gene often told was how when he woke up in the morning as a little boy ready to go to school, his shoes were shined at the foot of his bed waiting for him. And his father had gotten up before he went to work, shined his son's shoes. And that kind of attention was very much a part of Yonake's life, Gene. You'll, you'll hear us refer to him as Yonake sometimes, which is his name in Hebrew. So, Gene grew up knowing that the Son of God was real and that he should devote his life to serving him. And I'd say in a certain way he tried, but he found himself pulled by the desires of the world in many ways that he didn't have. He didn't have the power over sin that he knew he was supposed to have. And he'd, he'd been, I, I would say, on a bit of a carousel, going round and round, trying to find a way to overcome his sin and, and be a, a godly man. He was, a, he was an average student, an excellent athlete, Went through college, got a psychology major, went into the Army for a while, and uh, was a successful businessman here in Chattanooga. He worked today. He was a personnel manager at a textile company and uh, secretary of the Rotary Club. He was a school teacher, very personable man. But he found that his life after several failed marriages was folding in on himself and he didn't know why or what he could do about it. He'd already been to been to the, the altar call in the evangelical church that he grew up in. He'd been there 17 times rededicating his life and it wasn't working and he found himself increasingly dark. He, he left everything and sort of hit the road in despair, searching. For, for a few weeks, he was in a carnival. A friend of his had asked him to come help him out, and he was there. And as he was on the midway, in that carnival watching people go by uh, who were seeking entertainment, but purposeless. And he sat down on a, on a bench there in the midway. And he heard a voice inside saying, is this what I created you for? And he had no answers. Obviously, this wasn't what he was created for. And so he, he kept moving on. His father had died. And holding his, his father's hand at, at, at his deathbed, his father said, Gene, promise me that you will serve the Lord. 
And Gene said, I will, Daddy. But then he didn't. He found, found himself in a place where he really couldn't with a pure heart. And so he wandered out across the country, wound up in California, He's sitting on a beach, wondering what he was doing with his life. He'd been offered an excellent job, high pay, doing just, just a marvelous job, and he, he couldn't do it, he turned it down. So he's there staring out at the water, and a man who was swimming in the beach, you know, in, in the water, came up on the beach and, and came right up to him. Gene had no idea who this man was, and he said, give your heart to God. And turned around and walked away. <laughs> he walked, walked back in the water, and he never... He said, I don't know what, where that man came from. And then that, right around that time, he was in a, in a gospel mission there in Santa Barbara, California. And he, he told this story a number of times because it was very, it was really a, a momentous time for him because he said, as he sat in a, in a, on his bunk in, amongst 40 snoring derelicts, that his heart just broke and he said, he started begging God. He said, I, I don't know what I'm living for. I want you to take everything out of my heart that keeps me from you. I can't do it. And from that point on, he began to serve in that gospel mission for a number of months, just fumigating clothing and, and uh, making beds and just serving people. And so this is really, at, at that point, he really started having confirmation that the love of God was really put into his heart for other human beings. This was at the very height of the Jesus movement. And it's very difficult for people these days to imagine just how exciting those times were, but the Jesus movement was the result of the hippie movement. And the hippie movement if you understand the foundation of it, was white middle class young people who came from Christian homes and departed looking for love, joy, and peace. They weren't finding it in the pews of Christianity. And after they had lived a life of, of uh, immorality and drugs and seeking and, and going through many difficult things, Many of them turned to Jesus. They didn't, they didn't want to go back to the pew. That really, they wanted a new social order. They were looking for a revolution. They wanted to life, they wanted life to be full of love and joy and peace. All up and down the coast of California, people, young people everywhere, the the baby boomer generation, there were more young teenagers than there were adults meetings of all kinds just a lot of enthusiasm about the Jesus that they had found and you know they participated in a number of these things but he never felt at home in what was going on he didn't really know why either all he wanted to do was love people with all of his heart love God with all of his heart so Gene's in California and it was um, wild and crazy in some ways, foot loose and fancy free. A lot of Christian coffee houses and beach ministries and many different uh, activities going on. And people, the young people wanted to be in a circle. They wanted to play uh, Christian music. New Christian songs were coming along, uh, mostly with acoustic guitar and <clears throat> Just a lot of it, tremendous enthusiasm, but very disjointed and very disorganized. And uh, and all this time, Gene had been he he knew the Bible from his from his upbringing, 
and he was wanting to find out what pleased God, what was pleasing to him. And uh, he saw many things going on and that he knew that he had, he had great questions about. Just didn't know how that fit into what God's plan was for human beings. So at this time he goes up to, he's single, and he goes up to uh, Wyoming up to a ski resort there, ski area, and I don't know how how he wound up there, but there was a young woman there, uh, a, a ski bum, pretty California woman, uh, shy, quiet, and they were all living together in a sort of a little community of ski bums and it's not a derogatory term it's just what they are they they live they, they live to ski <clears throat> and there were two things that she really had great disdain for one was uh, Christians and southerners because she was a little bit of an uppity California girl and so here he comes they would sit around the table and he would just talk about the one thing that was really burning in his heart and that was the love of God and how the Son of God forgave him of his many sins and and he can forgive you too and and his heart is totally for you and I mean Gene was he was really on fire He had a purpose in his life. And, and a miraculous thing happened that this atheistic young woman began to really listen. He was so, so convincing because he was convinced. And she received faith. And she gave her life to God. She believed in the Messiah wanted to serve him and they got married Gene had left Chattanooga um, owing some debts and he felt in his conscience he needed to get that all cleared up so they moved to Chattanooga he was actually not planning on staying in Chattanooga but he needed to get that cleared up and so they arrived there and they both got jobs and Gene started looking around and young people in this town were without purpose. They were affected by the hippie movement. They were looking for something new. They didn't know what to do with their lives. They were looking for a reason to live. Really. And so he was given this house to live in for a few months by a friend. He took a, a large uh, poster board and got a rubber stamp that said rap sessions, Tuesday and Thursday, 7.30. He stamped the board and colored it up with magic markers and then cut it up into pieces and he had his cards and he started handing these things out. Rap sessions back in those days didn't have anything to do with what you think of as rap now, but it was conversation, talking talking about what's going on in your life and what life is about, anything of that nature. And so, <laughs> so he hands out these cards all over the place. He's talking to people, evangelizing really, because he's, he, was, he loves people. And, and he just, he hands out these cards and the first night people came. And this is a very, uh, this is a very telling event because it shows how Yonake lived his life. Gene, you'll hear me use the term Yonake sometimes, perhaps that's his Hebrew name. Gene saw all these people there and, and he didn't know what to do. 
and he actually exited the room and went out back behind the house, behind a tree, and said, God, what am I going to do? What am I going to tell these people? And our father said, tell them what you know. Said, oh, oh, yeah, I, I, I. Okay, so he comes back in and he just started talking about the very things that I heard him talk about when I met him, giving your entire life to the one who gave his entire life to you, life for life. Be free from your guilt. Find a sacrifice for your sin. And these young people were hearing this. Most of them had come from Christian backgrounds. And they kept coming, and he kept talking about God has a, a purpose for your life. Gene didn't, he did not have an agenda or a plan. All he had was circumstances coming to him and a heart to seek God, to find out what, what God wanted him to do. He did this every day of his life. Every day that, from the very first day that I ever met him until the day he died, he lived that way. He, all he wanted to do was love. And it communicated to people. It communicated to them so much that after one of these meetings, some of these young people were there and they said, do we have to leave? So what was he going to do? This is really where our community started, was people needing more than what they were getting in society at large, drawn to the word, wanting to be close, as close to God as they possibly could. I think Gene's reaction was, well, I don't know what to do, so he prayed. This situation caused them to start moving towards community. Now, Marsha had a job in a restaurant. She was, every time, she wasn't a person that just went out and just started uh, drumming up conversations with people, but when she waited on a table, these people would say, there's something different about you, what's, what's going on? And she would just tell them quite simply, well, I, I just, I love Jesus. I love him and my husband and I are here. I just started telling her story. And so th these uh, conversations got time consuming and the manager started getting upset. He said, I didn't, I'm not paying you to talk to these people. I'm paying you to serve hamburgers. <laughs> she, she came back and started talking to Jean about this situation. She said, I don't know what to do. I'm not trying to start these conversations, but people want to talk and then and then I don't have time to talk to them because I'm working. And at that point, God started speaking to Gene and, and he said, well, maybe we should just start our own restaurant and then we can all work together. All these people that want to be close. And, and really, it wasn't like uh, exclusive. It was because there were many people later on that worked at the at the Yellow Deli that weren't even a, a part of the community or anything. When people come into a Yellow Deli these days and they look around at the uh, barnwood, burlap on the ceilings, uh, rustic interior, peach baskets, and they, they ask what They've asked me before, uh, where, where did you get the, uh, the idea for this kind of decoration or arrangements? I've, I've often said, well, poverty. Because when Gene started out to build a restaurant, he didn't have any significant resources. They drummed up, they found a little building uh, out on Brainerd Road in Chattanooga. And it, was, and it was a little building, a little stone building. And uh, they had enough money for the rent. And then they started 
decorating it inside and, and uh, they came up or I think Gene came up with the idea, well, we, we, don't ha we can't just go buy wood, but we can tear down little barns. And, and so they would, they'd go out in his little 1954 Dodge pickup truck <laughs> and uh, tear down barns, pull the nails out and straighten them and reuse them, recycling at its best, and uh, worked with what they had, had, had sort of a, a rough idea how they were going to do it, and it, they would try different things. I wasn't there at that time, but I, I, I know how it went. And uh, a person came in and dropped a, this one of those old-timey kaching type cash registers on the counter and said, yeah, you'll be needing this and walked out. And uh, a plumber came in and volunteered his services. Uh, electrician, same thing. And it's just, things just started happening day by day. And uh, they painted the outside of it yellow. The name, as far as I know, came from uh, a, a little restaurant that that Gene had seen in uh, Jackson Hole, Wyoming, called the Yellow Deli, and uh, and it just went from there. Now, the the Jesus movement had really hit Chattanooga, and and so you had young people going around town honking their horn, going one way, Jesus, and. Uh, a lady came in the door. She walked right up to Jean and she said, your doors, your gates, your gates will never close, which is a quote from Isaiah. And Jean went, the woman just turned around and walked right out and said, your gates will never close. And, he's, and he wanted to talk to the woman, so he runs out the door after her and she has disappeared, vanished. Not a trace, and, and this is just a few seconds later. And Gene said, later on, he, he, he understood that we should be open 24 hours. And uh, he, he at, at times, he said, I, I wonder if it was an angel that said, I don't know. But that lady couldn't have just disappeared like that. But. I got the I got the idea I got I, I got the picture, and um, so they opened the restaurant. They pooled everything together, all of their resources. They lived out of a common pot. There was no salary. There's no nothing. To this day, we don't have a salary. We share everything in common. And the really interesting thing about this is that at that time we did not know how the first church lived. It wasn't like we we went to the Bible and saw what they did in Acts 2 and 4 and said, oh, well, we're going to do that. We actually, all we knew was that our sins had been forgiven us and we loved God for we loved the Savior and we wanted to serve him with all of our heart. And, and it was like instant family because we're all in it together, we all have one heart to be the same way and this is really this is really how all of God's people are supposed to be never changed and that's that's really the beginning of community for us was that we knew that God loved us and we wanted to be close to him and we wanted to be close to one another and we didn't make a separation between the two <clears throat> So they opened the Yellow Deli. It was open 24 hours a day. They did. They at this point did only had uh, the the single women were well, two of them I think were living in an apartment, and we needed another place. And Yonate found a house and was able to make a down payment on it and then we we uh, we had a place for the single men and 
this is how it started. Now, about three weeks after the Yellow Deli opened was when I came in on third shift. The gate will never close. And there I was. And uh, that was my experience. When I came in, I, I looked around and something was, I just felt like I was home. This is kind of a very difficult thing to describe, but I wouldn't have said that at that time, but as I look back upon it now, I knew something was relaxing in me, and I was getting to a place in my own heart where I was ready to hear the gospel, which brings people into a home, <sighs> always. So, That's pretty much the beginnings of it. it. started with a man who had a heart to love. And I heard Yonick say it, Gene, I heard him say it many times. All I ever wanted to do was love. And uh, that's really our heart. So if you ever come into the Yellow Deli, just look at the menu and you'll see where it says, we serve the fruit of the Spirit. Why not ask? And you can come in and have a meal, or you can find out what we're about, or both. You're always welcome. Got some yummy food? Come to the right place. The old yellow deli.